Good afternoon and welcome to the second event of the Stockholm series of public lectures on climate change and democracy. It's a, it's a pleasure to see so many of you here at International Ideas headquarters in Stockholm and also to know that many more are joining this event live online from all over the world. It's actually it's great to see a full house here because this time there was the option to uh, to attend the event online and yet you know we seem to have uh, a big audience for this event. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Kevin Casasamora and I am the Secretary General of International IDEA, an intergovernmental organization dedicated to supporting and advancing sustainable democracy globally. Our institute has 35 member states from all regions and our work is global, combining knowledge production with capacity development, convening political dialogues and doing policy advocacy. In this brief opening remarks, I, I want to do just two things. I mean, first, to explain a bit of the context behind this event and the broader Stockholm series. And second, to outline why International IDEA is so interested in the issues underpinning the series, including the critical question of how to mobilize democratic processes for climate action. The Stockholm series is a cooperative initiative a, put together by Stockholm-based institutions to bring attention to the interactions between climate change and democracy from different perspectives. It aims to inform, inspire, and engage both experts and the public at large through lectures and discussion on the interlinkages between climate change and democracy with events held approximately once every quarter in 2024. Tonight's event is the second in the series after what I would say was a very successful launch in April with Jenny King of the Institute for Strategic Dialogue speaking about the critical need for information integrity in the climate discourse. I want to thank International Ideas partners in this effort, the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, the Stockholm Environment Institute, the Stockholm Resilience Center, Future Earth, the National Council of Swedish Children and Youth Organizations, and We Don't Have Time. For International Idea, the Stockholm series represents a key moment in the launch of a dedicated work stream on climate change and democracy, which was endorsed by our Council of Member States and formally initiated last year. The basis for launching this work stream is rather simple. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time. And this is equally true for democracy as it is in other areas. Climate change is adding enormous stress upon already strained democratic decision-making processes. While the need for transformative change and viable solutions is by now well known, increasingly polarized societies are failing to build the necessary consensus for action. As a result, policy responses remain insufficient in both scale and speed. This pressure will only increase as the need for action becomes more and more obvious and the cost of inaction grow more and more significant. So that's the context for international ideas, interest and engagement in this area. So building a nearly three decades of experience, growing democratic knowledge and capacity, we want to help bridge gaps between scientists, citizens and policymakers to inspire and help develop strategies to strengthen democratic responses and resilience to climate change. Our work aims to identify ways to minimize democracy's structural weaknesses, such as electoral short-termism, 
to leverage democracy's inherent assets, such as the possibility of civil society to organize itself, and to spur innovation in democratic processes to enable climate-related action. And this is the case, of course, of climate assemblies. At a time when democracy is under attack in many parts of the world, climate change is both another threat among many, and also an unparalleled opportunity. If democratic governments can develop citizen-owned policy responses to climate change, democracy can be revitalized as a legitimate and credible political system for all people, including young people and future generations. And that is undoubtedly an opportunity worth seizing. One key part of this work is identifying ways to leverage public attention to climate change and public interest in the impacts of climate change, of climate action measures, to bring citizens more directly into climate policy deliberations and decisions, and thereby build consensus around climate solutions. So that's why I'm very pleased that the second lecture in the Stockholm series will be delivered by Dr. Nicole Curato, Professor of Political Sociology at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra, Australia, who will speak about how climate assemblies can accelerate climate action. Dr. Curato's research focuses on the transformative power of deliberative governance in fragile and conflict-affected settings. She recently co-authored an international idea publication on the potential of deliberative democracy for climate action, which was just published thanks to support from France, our newest member state, and is available for you to pick up on your way out. And when I mean recently published is recently published because this uh, came online uh, literally yesterday, I think. Uh, and I'm very happy about that, by the way. So I can think of a better person uh, to deliver this lecture than Nicole. So after her remarks, Nicole will be joined by Dr. Tim Daw, project leader at the recent Swedish Climate Assembly, and you will all have an opportunity to take part in this discussion. So thank you again for being here. I truly believe that these conversations are a step forward towards building more effective, inclusive, and sustainable democracies. But ultimately, even the best designed democratic structures will only work if people take an interest and show up. So I am very pleased and hopeful to see you all doing precisely that, showing up. So Nicole, it is a pleasure to welcome you to International Idea and to invite you to the podium. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon at the Stockholm series of public lectures on climate change and democracy. I'm grateful to International IDEA for inviting me, as well as the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and the network of organizations that made this lecture series possible. I also want to ground this presentation in the land where I work and live. I'm a diasporic settler in Canberra, the land of the Ngunnawal people. The work that we do at the Center for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance at the University of Canberra benefits from over 65,000 years of indigenous systems of knowledge. We are deeply honored to have the opportunity to learn from the traditional custodians of the land, especially as we ground our work on deliberation and the environment. I'd like to begin my talk by reflecting back on how Jenny King concluded her talk in the first lecture of the Stockholm series. She ended her lecture with a plea. She asked the audience not just to defend liberal norms, but to remake them for genuine inclusion, participation, and empowerment. She added, we want to build a livable future, and we believe democracy is the best vehicle to achieve that. And I couldn't agree more. 
I've been working in deliberative democracy for the past 15 years. My research focuses on the transformative power of public deliberation in disaster and conflict-affected settings. But what is deliberative democracy? In my work, I consider deliberative democracy as a political aspiration and a political project. As a political aspiration, deliberative democracy envisions a society where collective decisions are made based on an inclusive, informed, and reflective exchange of reasons. Of course, our societies right now are so far from these ideals. Politics has deteriorated into a shouting match among political elites. Hyperpartisan rhetoric rather than reasonable discussion has become the basis for many political decisions. Our media environment is not conducive for reflection. Our attention is constantly hacked by clickbait headlines and doom scrolling on social media. Misogyny and racism have become normalized. So how can we have meaningful conversations in a privatized public sphere owned by big tech companies? These problems in our communicative environment make deliberative democracy a suitable aspiration for the 21st century. And this is not a naive aspiration. Deliberative democracy is not a pipe dream, but a real world political project. Deliberation, after all, is a common practice in many democracies. Ministers, judges, experts, regulators all deliberate before making decisions. And deliberation in these institutions are part of a constellation of institutions that make up institutions of representative democracy. But I argue that deliberative democracy needs more than these institutions of representative democracy deliberating well. Deliberative democracy advances a different approach to collective decision making in that it places importance on the contribution of everyday citizens in deliberation. Deliberative democracy is based on the premise that citizens should be the author of the laws that govern their lives. But how exactly does that work? And so as a political project, witnessing the transformative power of deliberative democracy is important. And witnessing the transformative power of deliberative democracy in climate and conflict-affected settings is deeply personal to me. You see, I was born and raised in the Philippines, a country located in the Pacific Ring of Fire and the Typhoon Belt. This makes the Philippines one of the most disaster-prone countries in the world. Disasters in the Philippines are a frequent life experience. We have what historian Greg Bankoff calls a culture of disaster, where threats of natural hazards have led people to develop habits of cooperation and mutual aid. The year 2013, however, was a game changer. On November 8th, tropical cyclone Haiyan laid waste to a cluster of islands in, this, in some of the Philippines' poorest regions. Described as the world's strongest storm recorded in almost a century, the death toll was pegged at 6,000 at a time when the government could not accurately count the dead. A 23-foot storm surge reduced villages along the coastline to a scatter of tin roofs. Its absolute bedlam was how the head of the Red Cross described the scenes as corpses laid sprawled over debris. Typhoon Haiyan was a game changer as it transformed our thinking about disasters and climate change. Many have grown tired of being romanticized as resilient people. Happy washing was how Yvonne Su, Lady Lin Mangada, and Jessica Toralba described the imagery of people in high spirits after a tragic storm published on broadsheets, brochures of humanitarian organizations, and widely shared on social media. These images are a cover-up. We need more than mutual aid to survive our climate-challenged world. So motivated by this frustration, I put together a research project and conducted 12 ethnographic field visits over three years in a coastal community that survived the typhoon. I understood that Haiyan was a watershed moment, that the governance arrangements emerging from this crisis will have a lasting impact. And for the most part, it did. The disaster became a watershed moment for the Philippines, giving rise to a populist strongman winning a landslide victory in the presidential election after the typhoon. This was a man who showed compassion and strength to disaster-affected communities, as he promised decisive action in disaster and conflict situations. But this was also the same man who promised to kill all drug addicts, 
and a man who delivered on such a promise. Today, the International Criminal Court is conducting a probe into possible crimes against humanity. But this is not the full story. Moments of democracy under duress are also moments for everyday people to innovate, to claim space, to assert their voice and visibility, and to take charge of their political destiny. This is why deliberative democracy is an important political project. In my fieldwork, I have witnessed a community that crafted a mechanism for deliberative self-governance to catalyze post-disaster recovery. I witnessed everyday people, fishermen, market vendors, housewives, and shopkeepers work with community organizers to brainstorm, collect evidence, and reach a consensus on how they can build climate-resilient homes. With philanthropic funding, they were able to raise 1.1 million euros to secure a 12, hectare of 12 hectares of land that is now the site of over 500 climate-resilient housing units. I had the honor of observing them deliberate on various facets of the housing project, from choosing the materials to build their homes to their options for install installing renewable energy sources. They discussed the paint color of the house's exterior, the street names, and the criteria for the selection of beneficiaries or people who will receive the homes. I listened to community members reflect on each other's arguments, why one community member thought that only people who participated in deliberations should be the only ones qualified to receive homes, and why another thought everyone from their community should get a home regardless of participation, especially the elderly who find it difficult to attend meetings or mothers who need to look after their children. In their deliberations, they arrived at the conclusion that they are not just building climate-resilient homes that are safe from tsunamis. They realized that they were building self-governing communities to survive a climate-challenged world. This initiative took outside the state's official agenda of relocating coastal communities from the city to the foot of the mountains. They asserted their right to the city by refusing to live in so-called residential ghettos that the government constructed at the margins of the city. Last week, one of my key informants texted me. She lived in a different coastal community, one that the government forced to live in one of the residential ghettos. In her text, she told me that she had to move to her mother's home a few days ago. She said her family may have been safe from tsunamis by living at the foot of the mountain at the margins of the city, but they are now at risk of extreme heat. Staying in the city close to the bay was far preferable for they at least have a respite from 40 degree temperatures with the afternoon breeze. I asked her if she regretted moving to the housing project the government offered to her. She said she did not have much of a choice. The options were either being evicted and end up being homeless or doing what the government told her to do. That story is a huge contrast to the earlier story I told you about the community who developed a mechanism for deliberative self-governance. Public deliberation empowers citizens to take charge of their destiny by carefully weighing options and generating intentional action. The story of the Philippines reminds us that public deliberation is powerful when it is connected with existing networks of resistance and civil society action, in this case with experienced community organizers and philanthropic funders. Public deliberation is also effective when the norms of inclusive deliberation are built in the process or built in the process of self-governance from problem identification to action. Public deliberation is viable despite the constraints of the wider political context defined by patronage and strongman politics. And public deliberation works when the approach is systemic, when it has clear pathways to action. Of course, the Philippine story is not unique. Realizing the political aspiration of deliberative democracy is a global political project. In the second half of my presentation, I will shift gears and focus the discussion from a particular example of public deliberation in the aftermath of a disaster to a form of citizen deliberation applied in many parts of the world. All over the world, we are witnessing what the OECD calls a deliberative wave or the increasing use of sortition-based deliberative assemblies like citizens' juries and citizens' assemblies. 
This approach to putting deliberative aspirations into action is quite distinct from the story that we heard in the Philippines, though I think the two approaches can learn from each other. What sets citizens' assemblies apart from other forms of public deliberation? So let me identify two design features of these assemblies. Using philosopher Christina Lafont's language, the aim of citizens' assemblies is to serve the role of a mirror and a filter. As a mirror, the composition of citizens' assemblies seek to, to reflect the microcosm of society. Participants are selected using sortition or random selection, which can be compared to how respondents are recruited via, random, uh, via stratified random sampling in surveys to represent the wider population. Designers of citizens' assemblies uh, typically seek to recruit an equal number of men and women from different age groups, regions, languages, and years of education. And depending on the topic of deliberation, other social categories may also be considered in the stratified random selection, such as attitudes to climate change, as in the case of climate assemblies. At the heart of the process of random selection is the principle of equality and inclusion. In electoral democracy, the principle is one person, one vote. In a citizen's assembly, the principle is one person, one lottery ticket. Meanwhile, as a filter, citizens' assemblies aim to distill a range of views and synthesize complex evidence before arriving at points of consensus and identifying points of disagreement. And I'd like to emphasize this. Climate and citizens' assemblies are not all about reaching consensus. It's also a powerful mechanism to identify or crystallize the extent of disagreement. Some scholars argue that what sets these assemblies apart from other forms of democratic innovations is the emergence of considered judgment. Citizens' assemblies do not just ask citizens what their preferred policies are, as in the case of a poll, a focus group discussion, or public consultations. Citizens' assemblies ask citizens to go through informed and reflective deliberations before they put forward policy recommendations or a collective statement. And the outcome of these deliberations is a collective statement or a policy recommendation or policy recommendations turned over to the body or authorities that commission the process. What the commissioning body will do uh, with the recommendations depends on the context. So you might wonder, why bother? What is the theory of change behind citizens' assemblies? It sounds so onerous. Well, it depends who you ask. From my understanding of the literature, one popular view is that citizens' assemblies catalyze climate action in this manner. By bringing together a diverse group of everyday people, we hear the judgments of citizens not captured by dark money or politicians whose decisions are constrained by short-term electoral cycles. Empirical data shows that not only are everyday citizens competent deliberators, the judgment of everyday citizens about what to do with the climate crisis is actually usually ahead of politicians. I'll give you some examples later. What this means is that citizens' assemblies give a boost to politicians or policymakers who want to make more decisive steps to address the climate crisis. They can cite the climate assembly as an impartial body of everyday people who want to take far more ambitious measures than what is currently on the table. What this also means is that citizens' assemblies provide an alternative to political, uh, it provides an alternative political approach to addressing climate change. Borrowing the language of Eric Olin Wright, climate assemblies are a real utopia or a political institution that brings to life our most ambitious democratic aspirations. It provides an alternative to the shouting matches, the political deadlocks, the disinformation, the hyper-partisanship, and the profit-driven algorithms. It demonstrates how climate politics can and should be informed, respectful, reflective, and decisive. This is why a lot of attention is devoted these days to thinking about ways to institutionalize these assemblies or make them a permanent feature of climate governance. And I'll come back to this later. One paradigmatic example of a citizen's assembly or a climate assembly is the French Citizens' Convention on the Climate, which President Macron convened in, the, in response to the Yellow Vest protests in 2019. Over six months, 150 randomly selected citizens listened to scientists and economists and deliberated in small groups. 
At the end of the convention, participants proposed a range of recommendations responding to the question of how to cut the country's carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. This is one of the most high-profile examples of citizens' assemblies because the recommendations influenced France's climate policy. For example, the assembly member's recommendation to ban short-haul flights was implemented. But this is also one of the most controversial examples of citizens' assemblies. President Macron promised to submit the recommendations to the parliament without filter, but he backtracked on this promise and vetoed some of the more radical recommendations, such as making the intentional destruction of ecosystems or ecocide a crime. He said, what 150 citizens have written is not the Bible. What President Macron said may seem flippant, but it lays bare some of the discomforts that critics have against citizens' assemblies. Should the Bible, in this case, the Climate Action Bible, be written by 150 unelected, randomly selected citizens? Where does their legitimacy come from? What role should they play in policymaking? Should they only be advisory or should they be empowered to make binding decisions? Or is it enough that policymakers take their recommendations seriously? More specifically, can these assemblies, in fact, catalyze climate action? The Knowledge Network on Climate Assemblies just published a report finding that most climate assemblies, at least in Europe, have been commissioned by governments, often at the behest of parliaments. Marit Hammond, a sustainability transformation scholar, argues that these policy-oriented practices of deliberation have become overly accommodationist. Climate assemblies have served as a system-reinforcing tool a form of citizen engagement that has become at the disposal of authorities and assimilated into the same political system that deliberative Democrats seek to transform. Indeed, in my research on the threats to the integrity of citizens' assemblies, my collaborator Lucy Parry and I found that our colleagues who design and implement citizens' assemblies find the parameters set for deliberation by commissioning authorities to be too constraining. Governments still have the power to set the parameters of what can and what cannot be discussed by framing the question that assembly members are tasked to answer and approving the experts that can give testimonies and cherry-picking recommendations that already fit their political agenda. Of course, this is not the full story. For example, the Danish Climate Assembly, commissioned by the Ministry of Climate, Energy and Utilities, established a board, determined, the board determined the assembly's remit but it was the assembly members who decided which teams to prioritize. Other assemblies have started integrated systems thinking in their design by analyzing how the climate assembly's recommendations can interact with other policy domains and broadening the deliberations to consider the structural causes of climate change and ecological crisis. For Marit Hammond, however, we should be taking a closer look not only at the system supporting qualities of climate assemblies, but also at their system disrupting potential. Instead of only focusing on how climate assemblies can be linked with the policy process, we could also think about how climate assemblies can be linked with the disruptive protest movements or other forms of transformative action. And I can think of two examples here. The first example goes back to the case of the Philippines that we talked about a while ago where everyday citizens, in collaboration with community organizers, created deliberative self-governance mechanisms that can create sustainable material and political infrastructures that provide an alternative to the patronage and strongman-driven democratic regime. The second possibility takes a global dimension. And here I am thinking about the radical potential of a global citizens' assembly. And I want to spend the final part of my presentation laying out this possibility. For the past three years, my research collaborators and I have been conducting research on the Global Assembly on the Climate and Ecological Crisis. The Global Assembly took place in 2021. It came at a time when global climate cooperation was experiencing deadlocks and suffering from a legitimacy deficit. It is the world's first global forum of citizen deliberation using the format of a climate assembly. This means assembly members were recruited using a multi-stage civic lottery Algorithmic sortition identified 100 points in the world map from which assembly members would be selected, followed by local organizers' improvisation to recruit assembly members in those points using the principles of random selection. 
For 68 hours over 11 weeks, Assembly members listened to expert evidence and exchanged views online. And the output was the People's Declaration for the Sustainable Future of Planet Earth, which was disseminated at COP26. This was a civil society-led initiative, and in-depth reports about the Global Assembly are, are available online, and I will not repeat the insights from these reports today. Instead, what I want to do is to focus on one question that I believe is also shared by many people in the room and in the screen, and that is, what is the added value of a Global Assembly in sparking global action on the climate and ecological crisis? What is the point? Because we know that there are already spaces for citizens' voices to be heard in global climate governance. NGOs, activists, and civil society groups advance various agendas that represent the voices of various communities. Well, one can argue that a global assembly is different because it directly connects the voices of everyday citizens to global governance without the mediation of civil society actors, celebrities, or states. But why does that matter? Why do recommendations or declarations that emerge from deliberations of everyday citizens matter on the global level? Because when I talked to my colleagues specializing in global climate governance, they found the People's Declaration from the Global Assembly as not entirely groundbreaking. Calling to protect nature from ecocide is an agenda that has long been carried by global movements and networks like Stop Ecocide International. Another recommendation by Assembly members is to formally integrate education on climate change in school syllabi and government communication. But skeptics of climate assemblies would say, yes, that's blindingly obvious. We don't need to spend long hours and millions of dollars to generate obvious recommendations. And I think it's become cliche for citizens' assemblies or any climate or any citizens' assembly for that matter to call for more education. So, are citizens' assemblies just there to amplify existing calls for climate action? Is that the added value? I'm, I'm not so convinced. I don't think that's it. Because I think the added value of a global climate assembly is grounding and connecting the deliberations of everyday people from around the world on climate action. What do I mean by this? Well, one can argue that part of global institutions' legitimacy deficit is their distance from everyday people's lives. I was listening to the breakout sessions of the Global Assembly after COP26. So for context, the Global Assembly took place leading up to COP and deliberations continued after COP. And one task given to Assembly members was to reflect on and share their thoughts about the recently concluded uh, COP in Glasgow in 2021. In one breakout group, uh, several assembly members shared that they could not actually follow COP. It was not covered in their national media. Even if they had access to international coverage, the content was not really localized to their own contexts. So COP, in that sense, was detached from the lives of everyday people. But we can learn something from this. A particular function that the Global Assembly can serve is to connect the deliberations taking place in formal institutions of global governance, the deliberations taking place in the Global Climate Assembly, and the deliberations taking place within local communities. And for this to happen, we, and by we I mean academics, process designers, implementers, funders, and the Assembly members themselves, we need to invest our time and resources in creating mechanisms to ground the global to the hyperlocal and connect the hyperlocal to the global. And the organizers of the Global Assembly calls this the cultural wave. In our research at the Global Citizens Assembly Network, or GLOCAN, we have conducted an inventory and in-depth case studies of creative ways in which local organizers of the Global Assembly grounded the process and outcomes of the Global Assembly to their communities. We documented stories of local organizers who sought the endorsement of village leaders. Others wanted to collaborate with social media influencers to amplify the Global Assembly. Others realized the importance of securing the support of the imam or the parish priest to discuss climate change and what IPCC reports mean to their communities. I think this is a critical step for a global climate assembly to matter. While it's important to think about ways to connect the global assembly to formal institutions of global governance, i.e., will it make a difference in COP, 
I think equally, if not more important, is connecting the Global Citizens' Assembly to everyday spaces where deliberations about climate and ecological crisis are already happening. But that's not enough. Global Citizens' Assemblies don't only need to be grounded, they also need to be connected. I think the Global Assembly's added value lies in its function of connecting deliberations among everyday citizens taking place in local communities to deliberations among everyday citizens at the global level. I could envision the Global Assembly serving a space where, for example, an assembly member from the Niger Delta can share their lived experience of how their community suffered from contaminated farmland and drinking water because of an oil spill caused by a multinational oil company headquartered in Europe. I imagine the Global Assembly to be a space where we realize that communities from the Niger Delta are not deficient citizens who need more training and capacity building in deliberation so they can uplift their lives and influence their governments to do better. The Global Assembly can make us realize that actually communities in the Niger Delta have long pushed back against the abuses of Europe-based oil companies who left families eating, drinking, and breathing oil. I imagine the Global Assembly to be an opportunity where assembly members from Europe realize that the failure of deliberation did not happen in the Niger Delta, and instead that the failure of deliberation happened in Europe, that what is needed is to build not the citizens from the Niger Delta's capacity to deliberate, but what we need to build are European citizens' capacity to instigate and sustain public deliberations in their own countries about the regulatory environment that emboldens Europe-based oil companies to be reckless in their operations in the Global South. In other words, a connective global assembly can spark the realization that the quality of public deliberation in Europe on climate action determines whether people and the environment in the Niger Delta live or die. This, I think, is what a global citizens assembly can do in relation to climate action. A global assembly grounded on hyperlocal deliberations and cognizant of the connectedness of deliberations unfolding in places like the Niger Delta and Europe empowers everyday citizens to appreciate their distinctive responsibilities in acting on climate change. In other words, a global citizens assembly creates a mechanism for everyday people around the world to establish relationships of accountability with each other. A global assembly is not a global group hug. It is a space to have difficult conversations and in so doing, reimagine how we can and should relate to each other in our climate challenge world. It allows everyday citizens to ask, what are our responsibilities to each other? How can public deliberations in my community uplift your community? How can climate assemblies in my country better connect with the climate related issues in your country? I'd like to conclude my presentation by answering the question posed uh, in its title. Is public deliberation the key to accelerating climate action? The answer is yes, but with caveats. What is the purpose of deliberation? Is it to support the political system we are trying to change or disrupt it? Who sets the terms of deliberation? How radical are the possibilities we are allowed to consider and put into action? I'm a big fan of open questions, so I will leave it there. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to the discussion.